the capital asset pricing model is the most famous model in finance and there's one formula from that model that is used at every big investment bank a thousand times a day. It's the security market line. Let me show you what it is. Quick review what we did in the last video. We said the capital asset pricing model is a model that thinks about a very special world, a world in which every investor is a mean volatility investor. So everything that the investor cares about is just the mean and volatility of his overall portfolio. And we said if we make that assumption, we get a surprising result. We get the result that the market portfolio, so the portfolio that the overall market is holding is very special. It's the tangency portfolio. It's the optimal portfolio that you, just as every single investor in that mean volatility world should hold. And in this video, we're still going to use our assumption everybody is a mean volatility investor, but we're going to use that assumption to learn something about individual assets, not about portfolios, about individual assets and their prices and returns. And for that, I first need to give you some background information about how the volatility of a portfolio comes about. Let's look at this plot together. I have plotted three different stocks. That's the three gray lines. And those stocks are positively correlated, right? When stock number three moves up, then stock number two and stock number one also move up. And what I did is I formed a portfolio out of those three stocks. And this portfolio just means that I put parts of my money in stock one, parts of my money in stock two, and parts of my money in stock three. And this line here, the pink line, shows you how the portfolio, how this portfolio develops over a year. And if we look at the data of this portfolio, you see that the portfolio actually loses in value. It has a negative return of minus 54% because we start investing at above 20 and we end at about 15. So the portfolio loses a lot in value. I mean, that sometimes happens on the stock market. And it has a volatility of 2.7. So now let's do something. Let's add a fourth asset to that portfolio. And what you see on this graph is you still see the portfolio from the start. It's the pink portfolio. That's the portfolio of our three stocks. And you see another stock, a fourth stock. And this is this blue stock. And this fourth stock is once again positively correlated with our initial portfolio. You see, always when the portfolio rises, the fourth stock rises as well, right? So it's a classical positive correlation. And also when the portfolio drops, then our fourth stock drops as well. And in the purple line, you see what happens when I form the portfolio. You see that the portfolio value is exactly in the middle of our additional stock and the portfolio we had in the first place. And the volatility actually does not change at all. Why? Because of this positive correlation. We don't have a diversification effect. The volatility of the purple portfolio is still our initial 2.7 nothing changes. In other words, the correlation of a portfolio does not go down if I add a stock which is positively correlated, right? Let's now see what happens when I add a negatively correlated stock. So once again, our portfolio of the three stocks, this is the pink line here, and now I have another fourth stock, and this fourth stock is negatively correlated to that initial portfolio. You see, when the initial portfolio drops, the negatively correlated stock increases. And also the other way around, when the portfolio increases, the negatively correlated stock loses in value. And now look at the portfolio line. The portfolio line has a lot less volatility. It has this diversification effect. Why? If the initial portfolio goes down, my additional stock goes up, so the move in our portfolio nets out. It is less volatile. And you see it in numbers. I calculated the volatility for our new portfolio and it's only 1.9. So what do we learn from this exercise? The basic learning is that the volatility of the portfolio critically depends on the correlation structure between the stocks. If an asset is negatively correlated, taking up this asset into the portfolio will reduce the portfolio volatility. But if an asset is positively correlated, taking this asset into the portfolio will not reduce the portfolio volatility or even increase in some cases. And with that in mind, I can sketch to you the proof of the security market line. 
We're in the cap M. So every single investor only cares about the return and the volatility of his overall portfolio. So let's now say we're in our equilibrium state. Everybody holds a tendency portfolio, everybody's happy, and then we have a new stock in that market. And this stock is positively correlated with the tangency portfolio. And we can have case one. That stock has an extremely low return. What does that mean? If it has a low return, then our investor doesn't really like that asset because the return is low. So if I take that asset into my portfolio, I will lose on my overall return. So that's what I don't like. And also because that asset is positively correlated, I also do, I do not win on volatility. So if I take up this asset into my portfolio, my volatility either stays the same or even goes up. So I also lose on the volatility side. Taking up this asset is something I would never do. So an asset which is positively correlated with the market portfolio and has a low return cannot exist. There is no demand for this asset. Let's make another case, case two. Our asset has an extremely high return. What does that mean? Well, because it has an extremely high return, I like that asset. I like that asset's return because it increases the return of my overall position. But I don't like the volatility because the asset is positively correlated. So my overall portfolio volatility will either stay the same or go up. So I lose on volatility. But because I gain so much return by just giving up a bit of volatility, I like that asset a lot and I start buying and buying and buying that asset. And what happens if there's large demand for an asset? By the laws of supply and demand, if the demand of an asset increases, then the price of the asset increases. And now you need to think back to one of my first lessons. I told you when prices increase, then returns fall. Why? Because the payment of a financial asset, that is the fixed part. So if I change the price, returns will change accordingly. So what did that analysis here tell us? If we look at the return of the asset, it cannot be too low. And it also cannot be too high because otherwise it would not be stable. If the return for the asset is too low, no one will buy it. If the return for the asset is too high, everybody will buy it. And by the laws of supply and demand, the price will go up and the return will go down. So for our asset, which has a given correlation, there's just one correct return. It has to be in the middle of case one and case two. In other words, the return of that asset is uniquely determined by the correlation. It's just a function of the correlation. And that is it. That is the major insight of the cap M and the security market line. Returns are dependent on correlation. And now I can give you the security market line. Correlations and returns are measured in different units. You can think of this as degree Celsius and degree Fahrenheit. You need to convert the units, right? Correlation is a different unit than returns. So all the security market line is, it's a conversion function, convert, converting correlations into returns. And here is the formula. So let me, that, that formula might look confusing. So let me go over it. So we have the return of our asset and is given by the risk-free rate that can be approximated, for instance, by US government bonds. It might be about 1%. Then we have the covariance between the market portfolio and the asset we're looking at. And I have not talked about covariance yet, but the covariance between two assets, so between asset one and two, is defined as the correlation between assets one and two times the volatility of asset one and the volatility of asset two. So it's just a mathematical redefinition. And for some historical reasons, the security market line in textbooks is always written with the covariance and not with the correlation. And that's why I'm giving you the formula with the covariance. But then we also have the variance of the market. And that's also a given. It's historically about 3%. And then we have the return on the market minus the risk-free rate. Return on the market, also historic given, about 8%. 
and the risk-free rate about 1% again. So you hopefully now see that this is just a conversion function. It's a conversion function converting covariance or correlation between the market portfolio and the asset we're looking at into the return of that asset. So the deciding factor determining the return of an asset is just the correlation with the market portfolio. And that is pretty surprising, right? If I want to know, if I invest $100 in Apple, how much do I expect to get in a year? It just depends on how much Apple's stock value correlates with the market. And that is the only deciding factor. So let me ask you a question. Here's the Tesla stock. How risky is that Tesla stock? You can't say from the graph because in order to measure risk, you need to measure the correlation between the Tesla stock and the market portfolio. And because in that graph, there's only the Tesla stock, not the market portfolio, you, you cannot say anything about the risk of the Tesla stock. And this is actually how my finance professor opened his lecture. Risk is not measured by volatility, it's measured by covariance. That is the fundamental insight of the capital asset pricing model. And here you see Jim Cramer on CNBC, large American news network, and he's talking about risky stocks and he does not mention the concept of correlation at all. Normally, we don't spend a lot of time focusing on these higher risk names here on Mad Money, but tonight, I'm breaking form. We're going to start with a company we actually have on the show tonight, Celsius, which makes the most successful energy drink of this generation. Celsius just put up record sales for the first quarter, up 95% year over year. More important, just versus the previous quarter, their sales were up 46%. That's almost inconceivable. I think Celsius could be the next monster beverage, which is a huge success. Celsius could be the great non-tech growth company for the ages. Well, but I need to cut Jim Cramer some slack here. I think that this TV segment doesn't discuss risk in a conceptually correct way. But I can't go to Jim Cramer and say, I think your TV show is wrong because the Cap M says otherwise because he will respond to me and say, well, a capital asset pricing model is just a model. It does not depict reality, does it? And with that, he kind of has a point. Let me wrap up what we've done so far. So far, we made a very simplifying assumption. We said every investor is a mean volatility investor and only cares about the mean volatility of his overall position. And with that, we had some surprising insights. We found the tangency portfolio. It's just the portfolio that the market is holding. And we also found the security market line, a very fundamental link between correlations of assets and their prices and returns. So with that security market line, we can, in theory, explain asset prices. The price is just a function of the correlation of an asset with the market portfolio. But those results, they only hold exactly in a world where everybody is a mean volatility investor and everybody acts rationally. So what I want to do with you in the next video is I want to discuss with you if our formulas and insights that we just generated from theory, just on a piece of paper, actually hold in reality and how useful they are in understanding financial markets.